subject tonight is serving up encouragement in the family. And I want to start off by asking a question. Do you ever get a song on your mind and you can't get it off? Yeah, sometimes it's not always a church song. Is that right? What's going on your mind tonight? Home, home on the range. Everybody know that? Home, home on the range. Home, home, forgive me. says where seldom is heard a discouraging word wouldn't you like to live in a home like that hallelujah now that sounds like it may exist only in fantasy land out there where the deer and the antelope are playing that's too idealistic isn't it what we need though is not some far away blue sky or some far away range what we need is such an atmosphere right here in the church Hallelujah. So I, I want to make some new words to that song. I want you to listen to it. I'll sing the first, and you can join in after the second time. Oh, give me a church where folks in the lurch are encouraged then healed from above. Where seldom is heard discouraging words and the truth is modeled in love. Let's try it. Oh, give me a church where folks in the lurch are encouraged then healed from above. Where seldom is heard a discouraging word and the truth is modeled in love one more time oh give me a church where folks in the lurch are encouraged then healed from above where seldom is heard a discouraging word and the truth is modeled in love. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand praise tonight. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, have you ever been to a church like that? We need one like that because we live in a world that is putting people down, finding fault, and discouraging people. That's the kind of world we live in. And so we need a church where you can find encouragement. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We need a church where you can find encouragement and strength. I want to look at this word encouragement for a little bit. And checking the dictionary out, we find out that discourage, discourage means to deprive of courage, to dishearten, to hinder, to deter. And in contrast, the word encourage means to inspire with courage, to give spirit or heart or hope, to, to hearten, to spur on, to, some, to uh, stimulate, to give help. In thinking about these words, discourage and encourage, I thought of another one that starts with E-N, enthusiasm. And I found out that enthusiasm comes from the Greek word entheos, E-N-T-H-E-O-S. E -N -T -H -E -O -S. 
Now think about that a minute. Theos means God. In means into. So enthusiasm, if you're going to go back to the literal meaning, is to put God into something or someone. Now since that's true, we can go back to encourage. Encourage means to put courage into someone. You might be surprised. You might be surprised who needs encouragement. I read a story that came from Sports Illustrated about a 20-year-old boy named Brian Heinle. He had a storybook high school career. He was an all-state kicker. He was a tight end. He was a yearbook uh, editor. He was prom king. Uh, just uh, everything was going great. Now he's beginning at, at, at on the Nebraska State football team. Before reporting to practice, he went home to visit his parents. They had a 320-acre farm, and uh, that weekend he mowed the lawn. He took the walk with his father across the farm there, and on uh, Tuesday his mother noticed he was unusually quiet. And, uh, he was behind this woodshed there, took a 22 caliber gun, blew his head off. They found him about 4 o'clock that afternoon. Why? Nobody understood why. Everything's at the top going great. You'd be surprised who needs encouragement. One of his girlfriends knew a little something. She didn't know why, but she said, well, he was worried. She knew that he and his father couldn't take care of the farm by themselves, and he really wanted to be a pro football player, but he couldn't put on enough weight to get on a team he didn't think. So she didn't know if that was it or not. But did you know it just might be my son or your son? Or if I'm being my neighbor or your neighbor. My dad or your dad. And of course, mine are dead, but you know I'm speaking here. It might be the person next to you in church that needs encouragement. This business of discouragement is very real. And it's like a silent plague. And I can't emphasize enough to us tonight that we need a church where folks in the lurch can find encouragement. Not a discouraging word, but an encouraging word. Here at the church, hallelujah, this is not just a dreamy idea. We can all, uh, you know, can, uh, we are commanded actually by God to encourage people, to encourage one another. And if we fail to do that, who will do it? The world is certainly not going to do it. We live in a sadistic world and a sad world. And I want us to look at our, our Bible for a Bible basis for this subject, this subject tonight, encouragement. You know, the book of Hebrews, if you know a little bit about it, throughout the book, the spotlight is on the Lord Jesus Christ, the superior one. He's the one that's opened up the new and living way. Jesus Christ is the one that has made a way for us to have salvation. So we don't have to go through a system of good works. We don't have to go through some other person to represent us before God. We don't have to earn our way into the presence of God and hope that he'll hear us. But the, uh, the scripture says, since all this is true, in Hebrews 10, chapter 19, verse, it said, Heaven therefore, or since therefore, brethren, since all of this is true, we've got confidence to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. Since Jesus is a superior one, since he has opened up a new and living way, since we don't have to earn it by our good works, since we don't have to go through somebody else, we've got the confidence now to go into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ by His blood. Hallelujah. Since we have this confidence to enter into the presence of the Lord, and since we have a Christ who is a great high priest, we need to examine what He told us to do. There are three, let us, following that. Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. See, we're not lingering around with a heavy weight of sin upon us anymore. That's all been laid aside. It's not an anchor dragging us down. Since that is true, let us draw near unto the Lord and to one another. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us draw near, uh, it says here, with a true heart and full assurance having our hearts sprinkled from an evil, evil conscience and our body 
washed in pure water. We've been washed and by the blood of Jesus Christ. We've been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. We've got the blood of the Lord sprinkled upon our heart. And since all of that is true, we need to draw near unto Him. And we need to draw near unto one another. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But not only that, verse 23 says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. You see, since all of this is true about Jesus Christ, they got three let us here. And uh, so let us draw near and let us hold fast to the truth and to faith and to doctrine. Amen. But also, in addition to these three, look at verse 4, 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. That means let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. This is not just a suggestion. It's not an off-the-cuff, casual remark. It's not, oh, by the way, after you said all of this, it might be good if, if you're, while you're holding fast to the faith of God to the Lord that you encourage everybody a little bit. It's not like that at all. It's reinforced and commanded here by the very next verse, verse 25. See, verse 24, let us consider one another to provoke unto good love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting or encouraging one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Hallelujah. Did you know it's impossible to stimulate someone if you're not around them? You cannot encourage somebody to love and good works if you're not around them. We cannot encourage people if our lives are lived in secret caves and we're pushing people away from us. We're not mingling with people. If we're out of touch with people, if we don't encourage others, it, unless it's a face-to-face -face thing. So verse 25 is saying here, let us not neglect our own church meetings, as some people do, but encourage and warn each other, especially now that the day of his coming back is again drawing nigh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I want to notice two things here. Encouragement, if you look at this scripture, is not the responsibility of just a gifted few. But it is the responsibility of everybody that's in the family of God. Now, being the pastor might be the responsibility of just a few people. Being a Sunday school teacher might be the responsibility of just a few people. Being a trustee might be the responsibility of just a few people. Being quiz master might be just the responsibility of a few people. But encouragement is the responsibility of everybody in the church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We all are encouraged here, are advised, are, ex are exalted, are commanded here to let's encourage one another in love and to good works. That's the first thing that I want us to notice. The second is encouragement is not something we need less of but more of. We need more of. All the more as you see the day of Christ's return drawing near. That's what he's telling us, isn't it? All the more as you see the day of Christ's return drawing near. Why? Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3, 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times Perilous times and troublesome times. Or savage times. And if we're ever living in a savage time, we're living in that right now. You just read the newspaper every day. It's savagery everywhere, everywhere. Right here in Prairieville and Gonzales. It's also in Rwanda. Or is that how you pronounce that African country? And it's all in Somalia. And it's also in North Baton Rouge. And it's everywhere. Savage times. So you can say... This know also that in the last days, savage times will come. These are the days in which we live. That's why we need to more and more and more, as we see the coming of Christ approaching, to encourage one another. Hallelujah. That's why we need to encourage more and more. When we walk out of a loving fellowship of God's family, we're moving into a savage territory. We walk outside of the doors of this church. You're moving into rough areas.
and we're, we're threatened, we're intimidated. And so God's people needs to turn on the encouragement. Turn on the encouragement. Hallelujah. 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 The church of God and the family of God is not a place for verbal put-downs. It's not a place for sarcastic jabs. It's not a place for critical comments. It's not a place for harsh judgments. We get enough of that from the world. This is a place to assemble ourselves together and to encourage one another. Hallelujah. We need to come together and encourage one another. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. There's a Greek word, P-A-R-A-K-A-L-E-I-N. Parakalin. I guess you pronounce it. I'm not a Greek scholar, so I, but I believe my pronunciation will be as good as yours. So we call it parakalin. That was a word that was used over and over in Bible days by leaders and soldiers, generals. They used that word to cheer the soldiers on to fight. Kind of timid, you know, who wants to walk into battle and get killed, you know. So they used this word, uh, parakalin. It was used to encourage sailors to get on a ship that was going out on an adventurous voyage. They were hesitant. They were sailors were hesitant. Soldiers were hesitant. So this word parakalin was used to encourage them to go on. Now coming off of that word is another word, parakletos. This means the encourager, the one who's doing the parakalin, you know, the encourager. One who puts courage into the faint-hearted. This parakletos is one who nerves up the feeble and gets them ready for fighting or gets them ready to do something that is extraordinary. Now, you know, in the Bible, the Holy Ghost is called what? Go back to your Greek now. Huh? How you pronounce this, Bernard? Paraclete. It's the same word. The Holy Ghost is an encourager. One called along a side to encourage. We've all received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost encourages us. And with the anointing of the Holy Ghost, we need to encourage other people. Cheer them on. Send them out into the fight against the devil. Hallelujah. Those that are timid and weak. Hallelujah. Those that are standing before opposing forces. Lift them up. Encourage them. Who makes us able to, to, uh, uh, to cope with life? It's the Holy Ghost that dwells within our heart. And this Holy Ghost also gives us the power to encourage other people. And other people in the church. Praise the Lord. That's the word that is translated in our Bible, encouraged. It's in Hebrews 10, 10 25. That word is used, not forsaking our own assembling together as a habit of some it is, but encouraging one another, is what it says. There was a blind songwriter by the name of Ken Medina. And he wrote a song that if this is not the place, I don't have the words for that song. But he said, if this is not the place, talking about the church, where I can get encouragement, where can I go? If this is not the place where I can be lifted up, where can I fly? If this is not the place where I can get, gain strength, where will I find help? This has got to be the place where we get encouraged. This has got to be the place where we get strengthened. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I want to tell us a little bit of how to encourage people. And I'm going to limit the thoughts. There's a lot of ways that we can talk about it, but I'm going to limit it to the tongue, our words, and the tones that we use to carry our words can be used to discourage. And also, for simplicity's sake, I want to stick to the book of Proverbs. If you want to turn along with me to the 10th chapter, We're going to find out how to encourage people, since that's what we need so much. Proverbs chapter 10, and we'll read a uh, verse, we'll read of several verses, one or two verses at a time. First, 11 and 12, chapter 10, 11 and 12. The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sin. 
You notice how powerful the tongue is and the mouth is? The tongue is an instrument of forgiveness. It has the ability to conquer or conceal violence. It has the ability to cover up transgressions. You notice in verse, uh, the mouth of the righteous man is a well of life. Hallelujah. And so that, let's look at the 13th. In the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found. Did you know there is a transference of wisdom from one life to another through the vehicle of the tongue? What power the tongue has. What a fountain of life. It's an instrument of forgiveness, and it's also an instrument of concealment of violence. It's also a source of wisdom, the tongue. The mouth, the lips, you know the see. Look at verse 19, chapter 10, verse 19. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth, refraineth his lips is wise. Let me say that over in another translation. When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. When we come together, we don't need to just talk, 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 talk. But we need well-chosen words. Hallelujah. Look at uh, chapter 10, verse 20 and 21. The tongue of the just is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is little worth. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for want of wisdom. You notice? The tongue of the righteous is as choice silver. And the lips of the righteous feed many. Hallelujah. Look what you can do to encourage people with your tongue. Not a lot of talk and a lot of palaver and a lot of jabber, but choice words. Words of wisdom. Well-chosen words. Thinking before you talk. You can encourage people. Praise the Lord. Look at chapter 12, verse 17 and 18 of Proverbs. Chapter 12, 17. He that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness, but a false witness to see. There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. Have you ever received healing from someone's tongue? Soothing healing. Sometimes we're hurt so deep. And the wound refuses to heal. Dead, and he might be begin to scab over, and somebody comes and breaks that scab off again. Finally, it's ripped off, and you're so uncomfortable, you're so humiliated, you're so frightened, but you've been saved by some encouraging word that's come along from somebody from somewhere. Somebody, the eternal family of God, somebody here in the church, somebody full of the Holy Ghost cares deep enough for you look you right in the face and say a few choice chosen words. And that which was hurt so deep. The tongue of the wise brings to that It says here that we do the right thing. I want us to think for just a little bit. There's a lot of mothers and dads here tonight. How do you talk your children. Husband and wives, how do you talk to each other? Proverbs 18, 21. Proverbs 18, 21. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall be Sometimes fathers will talk to their kids like this. You're just a bum and you always will be a bum. Sometimes mothers talk to them like that too, you know. You're never going to amount to anything. Just over and over and over. Every time a problem between a dad and his son comes up, there you go again. You're just a bum. You'll never amount to anything. How do you think that's going to affect the child? It's going to make him hostile. It's going to make him defensive. It's going to make him angry. 
and he's going to take that out on everybody he meets all through his life. He's going to unleash that hostility and anger throughout all of his adult life. Dads, how do you talk to your children? Moms, how do you talk to your children? Pastors, how do we talk to people? I'm including me, him both, you know. And, and teachers, Sunday school teachers, how do you talk to the kids? Husbands, how do you talk to your wives? Wives, how do you talk to your husbands? Your tongue possesses the power of life and death. Don't think that your words will be overlooked or easily erased. When I was in the third grade, now you think about that. How long ago was that? Fifty-four years ago. But I still remember that teacher told me, you are dumber than the dumbest student I ever had in my life. I'll never forget that till I die. I'll never forget it. It's over here in St. Gabriel, too, all you Cajuns. I had gone to another school in the third grade, and we didn't study our multiplication tables. The last three weeks of school, I transferred to St. Gabriel Grammar. And they knew all the multiplication tables. I knew none. She just tried to get me to tell them to say them, and I couldn't say them. And so you're dumber than the dumbest student I ever taught in my life. I'll never forget. But in a moment of haste, dads, in a moment of haste, husbands, in a moment of anger, or haste, wives and mothers, we can say things to our loved ones that pierces the heart. Say something that rips apart the heart and leaves a scar that will never be forgotten. You can't change yesterday, but you can do something today and you can do something tomorrow. Hallelujah. Did you know it is never, never, never too late to start doing what's right? You can't do, you can't erase what you did wrong. So there's no use to lament about that. But you can start doing right tonight. And you can do right tomorrow. Hallelujah. And if the church is to become an encouraging church, it's got to become a home that has encouraging words spoken in the home. Now, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but I've been talking about this. What you are at home affects the church. What the saints are at home is what the church is. If there's put down in sarcasm and anger, words at home, the church cannot be a church that encourages people. Because who is the church? So I want to ask you, is your home an encouraging home? Let's suppose that I was an invisible guest. You didn't know I was there. What would I hear? Sarcasm, put-downs, caustic remarks, or good job. You're growing up. I love you. Hey, that's nice. I appreciate that. What would I hear? Oh, I understand. You made a mistake, but I'll help you with it. Death and life are in the tongue. Power of the tongue, death words destroy, they hurt, they create hateful and humiliating feelings. Life words, they build up and they increase and they give strength of character and they lift up uh, those that are down. Therefore, they life words set people free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Otherwise, they'd be in bondage. Unforgiving, fighting critical words. Those people, people who are unforgiving, people who are crit critical, people who issue fighting words are not encouragers. They don't encourage people. Only people who are excited about life can transfer courage. Hallelujah. People who are put down on themselves, and that's a bad thing. You, if you've got a bad self-image and you're put down on yourself and you're uncertain about your own self, you're not an encourager. You discourage other people. You 
got to have an excitement about life, an excitement about the church, an excitement about the Holy Ghost, excitement about your living for God. And when you have that excitement about your life in God, you then become an encourager to other people. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I want to wind this up a little bit by asking some questions, three critical questions. Who should I try to encourage? Well, ideally, everybody. But realistically, those with whom you have established a close relationship. You should try to encourage people that you have a close relationship with. See, this transferring of courage is encouragement is not just automatic. I want you to notice for a minute. Who do you think, who do you think I am the closest to? My wife and my three kids. I think that's four. I can hold up. But listen to this. Who do you think gets the least encouragement from me? Wife and three kids. That's awful, isn't it? Well, am I the only one? Who should you encourage or try to encourage? The people whom you have a close relationship with. Your closest relationship, I would just presume, is your spouse and your children. And many times they get the least encouragement from you. I believe we need to work on this encouragement here. It's a Bible command. A challenge. Start tonight and tomorrow to do something with your tongue and your mouth. I mean in sincerity to encourage your husband or your wife are your children. Don't put them down. Don't be sarcastic to them. Don't make them feel humiliated. What? Encourage. Encourage. Don't wait for them to hint for an encouragement. I don't get in the car and say, Sister Bernard, how was the message tonight? You know? <laughs> You're scared to do that. But she's a good encourager. And she usually tells me. If she doesn't tell me anything, I know I need to do some improvement on it. Because I know she's going to tell me something good about it. Or if I'm doctoring her wrong, she's going to talk about that too, but she tries to be nice about it. But, you know, uh, we, need to, we need not to wait for somebody to hint for, in, in, to, for us to encourage them. We need to voluntarily do it. You see? Because we understand their fear. We've got some of the same fears they have. We understand their, their need because we've got some of the same needs they have. We understand that their weakness. And so we want to give them a statement of strength. You know, a lot of our children do bad in school when they would do a lot better if they got a statement of strength and support from their mom or their dad. They need it. How about your close friends? ever uh, assume that they don't need encouragement? Don't do that. You see, we have on a lot of veneer. We have on a lot of layers of veneer. And when you see and talk to people, you generally don't know what they feel down inside their heart. You ask somebody how they're feeling. And almost every time they're going to say, okay or fine or whatever. But if they think you really want to know, they'll give you about 15 or 20 minutes of all the problems in the country. Brother Nixon across the river whose son got hit by the car. Justin, I believe he was. Joshua, just, I can't remember his name right now. But anyway, this was at the men's conference last year, I believe it was. I asked him, how's uh, Justin doing, Joshua? I can't remember. Jordan, Jordan. How is Jordan doing? He said, well, he's progressing. And that's what he said. You know, he's going to pass on off. I said, but Brother Nixon, how is he really doing? I said, I, like, I want to know because we've been praying for 
Then he sat down and went through about 15 minutes of all the bullet boys' problems. But you see, that's usually, we just assume because we've got so much veneer out here. That, oh, how you doing? I'm fine. Ask Molly. She's not here tonight. How she's doing? She's going to tell you fine. But she's got an incurable disease. She's got a, a swell, a swelling of her body. She's taking so many steroids. It causes her blood pressure. She's not going to tell you all that. She's going to say, I'm doing fine. Don't assume your close friends don't need encouragement. They do. First question, who should I try to encourage? Those that you have a close relationship with. Next, how can I get through to someone with encouragement? And that, of course, I've covered that a little bit because of the veneer. It takes time to get through all the things. It takes time to get through the list. It usually involves pain. You have to cultivate a deep relationship or a, a level of love and acceptance. I've, I've, uh, I don't know if I should say this. Brother Hetfield is not here, so I'll just say it anyway. But, you know, he, he stopped at church for a while. Now he's back on Sunday. He really uh, got a good blessing. His wife did too, and he really uh, was very uh, apologetic about not being able to be here Sunday morning. But you know, about a month or two ago, that wouldn't have happened. That intervening time, all I did was went to his office, uh, called him on the phone, and I just opened up my ear, not my mouth. I just listened and let him talk, and he talked, and he talked, and he told me. And he, told me. he got all out of his system, all that stuff that he down in me. Just needed somebody who was close enough to him who would take the time, who would endure the pain, who would put up with the pain that he's putting up with. I didn't tell him, you know, you ought to be in church. I didn't tell him you're going to backslide and lose out with God. I didn't do anything like that. I just listened. And now you see him back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How do you cultivate a close relationship? It takes time. It takes time. Now, I want to say this to those of you that are witnessing people and trying to bring people to church. You've got to develop a close relationship with them. Just because you invite them doesn't mean they're going to come. You go and you go and you go and you go and you get discouraged yourself. But you just go and be kind and listen and encourage and strengthen and go and go and go. And sooner or later, they're going to come if it's not here, they're going to go to somewhere else in Pentecostal church that they live. You heard me mention this before, but the King family in Hammond, I went every Saturday for two years. I rarely missed a Saturday. Finally, I moved away from the place, went to the mission field. But some 25 years later, one of the members of the King family came and found me in Jackson, Mississippi. He said, we just want to tell you that after you left, we came to the church to see the Holy Ghost, and we're all still in the family today. They made a special trip to Bible. If you want to be an encourager, you got to take the time to do it. you got to endure the pain that it entails. Hallelujah. You've got to cultivate a deep level of love and, of, and acceptance. Hallelujah. And then the third. What is the essential technique? Don't talk to them so much. Talk less so you can feel more. Be sensitive to timing. Some of us have no sense of timing. We just blurt out, you know. But you've got to be sensitive to timing. You have to give some attention to the wording. You can't judge or preach. Don't judge them. Don't preach to them. No sarcasm. Examine your motives. You can be an encourager, if you will. I'm going to repeat those things. What is essential? What is the essential technique that you have to remember to be an encourager? Talk less so you can feel more. Be sensitive to timing. Watch your words. Choose your words carefully. Don't judge or preach. No sarcasm. Examine your motives. 
Shall we stand? And I'd like for our Home on the Range pianist to come. Oh, give me a church where folks in the lurch are encouraged and then healed from above, where seldom is heard a discouraging word and the truth is modeled in love. Oh, give me a church where folks in the lurch are encouraged then healed from above where seldom is heard a discouraging word and the truth is modeled in love once again oh give me a church where folks in the lurch are encouraged and healed from above where seldom is heard a discouraging word and the truth is modeled in love i'd like for us to pray tonight that the lord would help us to be an encourager we've got the encourager down in our heart and if we use the Spirit of God that dwells within our soul, each one of us can be somebody who encourages somebody else. God, help me to be an encourager. Let's pray right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. I need the power of the Holy Ghost.